Hello everyone. We are going to explore a big chunk of world history tonight. Just for a moment, think about the language you speak, the laws you follow, some of the architecture around you, or even these images that pop up in your mind when you think about the antiquity. All of this was influenced, directly or indirectly, by ancient Rome. And this is the story I will start telling you about tonight. This story is in two parts, and this is the first one. So we're going to see how, over more than a thousand years, a city has risen higher than any other before or after morphing into a kingdom, a republic, and then an empire that spread its culture and technology on three continents. We will talk about the city of Rome itself, of course, and its empire too, how it was conquered, organized and developed. We will also see how Rome reinvented itself several times along its very even full history. And I will try as much as possible to evoke every aspect of it. The way of living, how Romans saw their world, their architecture, their military, economy, culture, religion, so this is going to be another long journey through space and through time. And you can now start to get ready for it. You will find timestamps in the first comment if you wish to return to the video later or jump directly to a particular topic. And this story will also be recorded in French and Spanish soon. But for now, adopt a comfortable position, have your headsets on, and, as usual, feel free to shut your eyes anytime, as you don't need to watch to follow along. Our journey begins right now. Imagine you are in the center of Rome one day in the beginning of the 3rd century. You would feel like you are in a place like no other in the world. In a sense, this is the center of the known world. Rome has about 1 million inhabitants. No other city you would have heard of could match that. It has breathtaking architecture and monuments. The Forum is the busiest marketplace and political center in the world. The city has incredible infrastructure with fresh water brought by 11 aqueducts, public baths, houses have heating systems, roads and streets are covered in stone. It offers entertainment to its population on a scale that no other place in the world could compete with. There is a giant colosseum for shows and gladiators fights. There is a hippodrome for chariot races. There are theaters, shops, public and private parties all the time. The large population is sustained with huge quantities of food imported from every corner of the Mediterranean Sea. There are temples of multiple religions, including traditional Roman gods like Jupiter, Mars or Apollo, their Greek equivalents, and temples to the main gods from faraway provinces like Osiris, 
Isis or Sol Invictus. And there is also this new religion called Christianism with a single god and a critical view of Roman society. So they are regularly forbidden and persecuted because they are disloyal to Rome. But this is no big concern for now and you know that nothing, absolutely nothing, could seriously threaten the might of Rome. From the city, you could travel many days or even weeks by sea or by land on modern and well-maintained roads and you would still be within the frontiers of the empire. Everywhere you would find more cities built like small replicas of Rome with a forum, temples to Roman and local gods and people who have adopted Roman customs and mixed them with their own. For a very long time already, this giant empire has kept peace within its frontiers. Not perfect peace, because there were times of trouble or internal fight for power at the head of the state. But still, this gigantic territory is incomparably safer and wealthier than it was before the age of Rome. And you can also be confident that Rome will keep expanding. It has not even reached its maximal extension yet, and it seems to be built to last forever. But all this did not happen in a day. It took centuries for Rome to emerge as this invincible power with tens of millions of inhabitants. Rome had humble beginnings, and it all started about 8 centuries BC, in central Italy. The Romans had a legend about their origins, the legend of Romulus and Remus. According to the legend, Rome was founded in 753 BC, as a city and a kingdom by Romulus. Romulus and Remus were twins, and they were the sons of Mars, the god of war, and the virgin Vestal. Vestals were priestesses of Vesta, the goddess of the earth, in ancient Rome, and they existed, for real, for centuries of Roman history. They formed a college there were very few of them, only two to six, depending on the period, and they took a vow of chastity. Then they served the goddess and looked after a sacred fire that had to burn constantly. Their worshipping and cultivation of the fire were believed to be crucial to Rome's well-being and continuance. So, Returning to the legend, when a Vestal became pregnant, she had to abandon the twins, and they were fed by a she-wolf. The image of the wolf feeding Romulus and Remus is one of the symbols of Rome. Later, Romulus founded Rome and killed his brother Remus, and to develop the city, he launched an expedition to abduct Sabine women to populate Rome. The Sabines were a people who lived in central Italy. They are not legendary. They existed and progressively they merged with the population of Rome. It seems this story about Romulus and Remus appeared around the 3rd century BC when Rome had already grown a lot, and obviously it is a myth. But episodes like the abduction of the Sabine women 
have roots in reality. So how did Rome appear? The site where Rome was built is famous for having hills. There are seven main ones. And the site was occupied for a very long time, including before the foundation of the city. As far back as in prehistoric times, there are signs of occupation. From the 10th to the 8th centuries BC, there were little hamlets on these hills, probably populated by shepherds. In the, the 6th century BC, the region of Rome, the Latium, was occupied by an antique people called the Etruscans. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them in a minute because they were very influential on the culture and traditions of Rome. And from this period, the 6th century BC, the various groups of houses and villages merged into a town. A light fortification was built around it and Rome became a small city. This region of Italy was populated by tribes under the influence of the Etruscans and the newly founded Rome became the head of a small federation of cities in the Latium with an Etruscan king. So who were the Etruscans? The origins of this ancient people remain a bit mysterious and gets lost in prehistory. Their ancestors already lived in Europe several thousand years ago, before they developed a civilization by the end of the Neolithic in what is Tuscany today. Then they expanded north to northern Italy and south to central Italy. They never formed a single state like a kingdom, but their cities were part of leagues working like federations and they controlled a big part of Italy for several centuries until they were vanquished and assimilated by Rome. Because the origins of Rome remain unprecise, there are conflicting views about the role of the Etruscans. We know that the Latium was populated by tribes that were not Etruscans and the tribe that populated Rome was called the Latins. But it is unclear whether the Latins founded Rome and then fell under the influence of the Etruscans, or if the Etruscans themselves took the initiative to found the city and organize it. What we do know is that the first kings of Rome were Etruscans, and the Romans adopted many traits from their culture and society. The Etruscans had achieved the organization of their society into a state or several states. It sounds like a given today, but in the antiquity it was not. A collection of tribes could live on a given territory without creating a central power and an administration. Forming a state implies a certain level of organization and political thought. The Etruscan political system changed progressively. It was initially a monarchy with kings, but some cities became republics, just like Rome would be later. By republic, we are not talking about a democratic system as we define democracy today. It was an oligarchic republic where a few families controlled the state and made decisions. They founded numerous cities in Italy that became Roman cities later. And they developed an unique culture 
they had a pantheon of gods and goddesses that are completely forgotten today, like Katha, Yusil, or Laren. And they were in contact with the Greeks and very influenced by Greek culture and architecture in particular. The first Roman architecture was copied on Etruscan styles, so indirectly it took on this Greek influence. The Etruscans had developed also very refined arts and crafts like sculpture. Their bronze sculptures were famous and often exported to other parts of the Mediterranean world, painting, pottery. And their aristocracy lived a life of leisure and pleasures that also influenced the Romans. Wealthy people had large houses with frescoes and all sorts of decoration. Their level of refinement existed around the Mediterranean Sea in the 6th and 5th century BC, like in Greece or in Phoenician cities, but it was uncommon. And on many counts, the Etruscans were an advanced people. The history of Rome as an independent and expansionist power began in 509 BC when the Romans ousted their Etruscan king, Tarquinius, and founded a republic. This was the beginning of a long struggle, several centuries of almost constant wars with conquests and setbacks, from which Rome emerged as the dominant power in the Mediterranean world. So what happened and why did Rome become independent? Since its foundation, the city had grown and the majority of its population was this Italic tribe called the Latins. Like other tribes, I mentioned the Sabines earlier, the Latins were an Indo-European people. Their ancestors had migrated westward starting several thousand years before, in the same migration waves that brought the Celts to Western Europe and the Greeks to the south of the Balkans. We don't precisely know when and how, but after settling in Europe, Indo-European people mixed with the inhabitants they found and they strongly influenced their culture. Italic tribes are the representatives of this Indo-European migration that settled in Italy, and they remained separate from the Etruscans, who, as far as we know, based on their language and uh, DNA tests made on remains, were not Indo-Europeans. The exact reasons that led to Tarquinius being overthrown are unknown, but it is probably because with the growth of Rome, families that had been living in the city for generations had become much wealthier, more influent, and wanted to have a say in politics. They must have organized this coup to get rid of the king and share political power between them. These well-established families are a central element to understand politics in ancient Rome, especially when it was a republic. They form a sort of aristocracy, even though they didn't have nobility titles, their family name and their belonging to a particular family, a particular gens, plural gentes, with a common ancestor, was crucial for their social status. These influent families that seized power when the Republic was founded are called the Patricians. 
that as Rome kept growing in the following decades and centuries, an ever more important proportion of the population was no longer affiliated with patrician families. But they still wanted to be heard at least, and they formed the plebs, the Roman citizens who were not patricians. Later, the term plebs became applied more widely to all ordinary people as opposed to the elite. But being a plebeian in Rome was not the worst possible social position. They were still citizens. Slaves lived in Rome too, I'll tell you about that later. And the plebs obtained rights. They had their tribunes, their representants, and a people's assembly. So this people's state of mind was a constant preoccupation for the Senate that represented the patrician families. And the Senate advised the two consuls, elected every year at the head of the Republic by the citizens. For centuries, until the end of the Republic, the system looked unstable with constant power struggles. And yet, for centuries, every time Rome needed to be defended, or when big decisions had to be made, the various factions managed to make it work without putting an end to the Republic. It was suspended sometimes and replaced by a time-limited dictatorship in case of emergency, but it proved resilient for almost 500 years. This is a lot of time for a political regime. You wouldn't find many countries in the world today that have maintained the same, the exact same political system for such a long time. Technically, some countries have kept a monarchy until today for longer, but it now works very differently than it did four or five hundred years ago. I told you the story of the Roman Republic was shaky. Apart from internal tensions in Rome, there were considerable hardships. When Rome became a republic, it was still a marginal, forgettable power in the Mediterranean world. Greece was much more relevant. Greece was a collection of small city-states and kingdoms. But Greek culture, and trade too, was highly influential. And wherever you were in the Mediterranean Sea, from Spain in the west, the Levant in the east, you were never very far from a Greek presence, because Greek cities had founded many colonies all around the sea. There were also the Phoenicians, a people of sailors and traders, based in the Levant initially, roughly what is Lebanon today, and they also developed remote colonies and trading posts all around the Mediterranean Sea, the most famous of these colonies being Carthage. North of Italy, on the other side of the Alps, lived Germanic tribes and the Gauls. These were not politically organized and considered barbarians, but still a big threat because of their numbers and their ferocity in war. So Rome started expanding modestly by absorbing small towns and villages and then expanded to the mountains around Latium, including to the territory of the Sabines. This episode that saw the Sabines become part of Rome was probably the origin of the mythical story about the abduction of Sabine women. 
in the 4th century BC, Rome was threatened by a Gaul invasion of Italy. The Gauls lived mainly on the other side of the Alps in modern France, but they had occupied the north of Italy. And at the beginning of the 4th century, they attacked the Etruscans that lived between them and the Romans, and they looted Etruscan cities and kept marching south in the Italian peninsula. They bet the Roman army, and they occupied Rome almost entirely. The only part they could not take possession of was the fortified capital, considered to be the heart and origin of the city, on one of the hills. Eventually, the Gauls accepted to leave Rome with a big ransom, 1,000 pounds of gold. And there is a famous anecdote. It's hard to tell whether it really happened or not. When the Romans were presenting the ransom that was being weighed on a scale, the Gaulish chief, Renus, would have thrown his sword on the scale to make it heavier and said, Vae Victis, which is Latin for woe to the vanquished meaning that those who are defeated are entirely at the mercy of their conquerors. So Rome's beginnings were not that brilliant. The city was little more than a small state a century after becoming a republic, and it was already defeated and occupied. After the Gauls left, a fortification wall was built around the city, but for a long time, Rome remained stuck in a long, intermittent war against the Samnites, another Italic tribe that lived in south-central Italy. This war lasted for 70 years, and Rome suffered big defeats along it. But ultimately, they managed to subjugate the Samnites. In the 4th and 3rd centuries, Rome was focused on controlling Italy, conquering Etruscan regions to the north and fighting in the south against various opponents, in particular King Pyrrhus of Epirus. Pyrrhus was a Greek general and then King of Epirus in the west of Greece. He fought against Rome for the control of South Italy and won several battles, but at such a cost that he is mainly remembered through the phrase Pyrrhic victory. A Pyrrhic victory is when your victory costs you so much and leaves you so exhausted that it doesn't feel like one and you cannot benefit from it. After years of fighting, Rome finally became victorious and expanded to the south. So about a century after it was occupied by Brennus, Rome had reversed its fortune and become a regional power. As you see, war was almost constant, and early Rome was at risk of disappearing if it was vanquished. This precarious situation lasted for decades in the 4th and 3rd centuries BC. And just as Rome was becoming a bit more comfortable in Italy, began the rivalry with Carthage and the Punic Wars. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But in the meantime, it didn't stop the city from growing and developing a civilization of its own, taking in influences from the Etruscans, the Greeks, Italic tribes, and uh, other people from around the Mediterranean that the Romans came in contact with. Apart from their tenacity, the Romans developed during this period 
an ability to absorb and further develop technologies and rules of urbanism that they used to their economic and military benefit. The first aqueduct to provide fresh water to the city was built shortly after the Gaul invasion and so was the first main road, the Appian Way, via Appia in Latin. This road connected Rome to Brindisi in southeast Italy. The building of Roman roads started from about 300 BC and the roads are one of the biggest Roman assets in the conquest and continuance of their empire along the centuries. No civilization in the past had ever built that kind of infrastructure on such a scale. Roman engineering and architecture kept being developed until the very end, and it represented a peak in technology. Actually, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, many technologies were lost and were not rediscovered or their equivalent until the very late Middle Age or the Modern Age, a millennium later. Roman roads were built to minimize repairs and allow the movement of troops and people in the most efficient and fastest ways possible. The main roads were excavated and inside this ditch that had been dug, various layers of materials, including sand, gravel and rocks, were dumped. The flat surface was obtained by a last layer of stones and concrete. The roads were straight and generally the Romans would engineer solutions to obstacles rather than circumvent them. They dug tunnels or they built bridges. It is one characteristic of the Romans that makes them appear very modern to us. They had a drive to use technology to their advantage and to solve problems. They also modeled the geography to suit their needs, not just the roads. No civilization before them had built that many bridges, aqueducts, or invented complex systems designed for comfort. Roman bath, for example, had water heating systems with metallic tubes to transport the water. Houses had heating systems based on sending hot air under the floors to warm them. The Romans used a type of concrete that allowed architectural prowesses with high roofs and domes that had never been built before. Innovation was a positive value to them, whereas many antique societies, including some of the most brilliant, like Egypt, did not really care for it and did not try to innovate. So this innovative drive and also the willingness to adopt any technology that works wherever it comes from is a Roman characteristic that explains a lot of Roman expansion and longevity. The Romans ended up with much better infrastructure, weapons, warships, even though it was initially not their strength, agricultural productivity than any of their neighbors. And this made the, the Roman way of life more attractive to other people, making them accept conquest more easily and made Rome wealthier and better organized than any other civilization before. But this type of advantage appears in the long term 
and even though the early Roman Republic had managed to control most of Italy in the 3rd century BC, it was faced with maybe its biggest opponent to date, Carthage. I made a story about the history of Carthage that you will find in the description. Carthage was a Phoenician colony that developed its own sphere of influence with smaller colonies and trading posts in the western half of the Mediterranean Sea. The city was in Tunisia and by the 3rd century BC it had turned into the largest trading power in the Mediterranean world. Its power was based, in particular, on the control of the sea, with a considerable merchant and war fleet. Carthage occupied the west of the island of Sicily, the islands of Sardinia and Corsica, parts of North Africa and the south of Spain. Its expansionism clashed with Rome's in the 3rd century around the control of Sicily and also the control of the lucrative sea lanes that connected the western Mediterranean with Greece, Egypt and the Levant and the north-south routes between North Africa and the south of Europe. Rome and Carthage became arch-enemies for a century and had three main wars until Carthage was defeated and literally destroyed. These wars between Rome and Carthage are called the Punic Wars. The first one started in 264 BC and lasted for more than 20 years. It was initially difficult for Rome. Its fleet was lost in a storm and Rome tried to besiege Carthage, but the Roman legends, I'll tell you later about the Roman army, were little efficient against Carthage's tactics using war elephants and a very good cavalry from their allies, the New Mids. Later, the situation improved for Rome. They forced Carthage to evacuate Sicily and they won a decisive naval victory. In 241 BC, Carthage accepted peace and signed a treaty that abandoned Sicily to Rome. And Rome also took advantage of Carthage's weakness after the war to annex Sardinia and Corsica. But this peace treaty was really just a truce, because the antagonism between the two states had not been really solved. Carthage wanted a, a revenge, and 20 years after the first Punic War, it now had a brilliant general, maybe one of the best military commanders of all time, Hannibal Barca. Once again, Rome's existence was about to be threatened. Hannibal gathered a massive army in Spain, 50,000 infantry, 10,000 cavalry, plus war elephants. And Carthage took the initiative by attacking a Greek colony allied with Rome on the coast of Spain. Then. Hannibal crossed Spain, the south of Gaul, and the Alps with his army, directly threatening Italy and the territory of the Roman Republic. Rome sent various armies against him, which were all defeated, and Hannibal kept marching towards uh, the center of the Republic, towards Rome. In 216 BC, one of the most important battles of the antiquity took place in Cenae, 
and the Gaul's army had suffered from attrition after this long journey, the passing of the Alps and several battles. So, at this point, the Romans could field twice more soldiers on the battlefield. And yet, this was not enough. Hannibal managed to circle the Roman army, which moved in very strict and rigid formations. And it was a massacre for the Romans. Hannibal could have attacked Rome, which was now defenseless, but happily for the Romans, he uh, didn't do it due to dissensions between his officers and the uh, exhaustion of uh, his troops after such a long journey and multiple battles. So he stayed in Italy, but did not dare to attack Rome. And this gave time to the Romans to come back into the war. In the following years, his army was lost due to attrition and counterattacks. And several years later, a Roman expedition headed by General Scipio took control of Spain and then moved to Africa. The new Medes who were allied to Carthage, changed alliance and uh, passed to the side of Rome. With help from their new allies, the Romans defeated decisively the, Carthag the Carthaginian army in Africa in uh, 202 BC. A new peace that turned Carthage almost into a protectorate of Rome was signed the following years. And with the end of the Second Punic War, the threat of Carthage was finally removed. But it was not the end yet. Fifty years later, the Romans grew worried again about the possible resurgence of Carthage. And they had been so traumatized by uh, past wars, and especially uh, Hannibal's expedition in Italy, that they decided to take no risk. They started a third Punic War in 150 BC and besieged the powerful city for three years until it surrendered. The survivors in Carthage were sold as slaves and the city entirely destroyed finally removing any future risk for Rome. And it is true that once the Carthage Malays eliminated, Rome would now expand faster than ever in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC. After the Second Punic War, Rome conquered the north of Italy that was still in the hands of Gallic tribes pacified the Spanish provinces taken from Carthage and also enlarged them and it started to be involved in Greece. I told you earlier that Greece was in its golden age, the so-called classic age, when Rome was taking its independence as a republic. Then, when the early Republic fought for its survival and expansion in Italy, the main events in the Mediterranean world were actually happening in the East. Alexander the Great was conquering one of the largest empires ever in the Middle East and beyond. But after the fall of Carthage, the Greek world was somewhat decadent. Alexander's empire had not survived long and been fragmented into uh, several Hellenistic kingdoms. So Rome entered the game of alliances with uh, some of these kingdoms that were fighting between them. Rome intervened in Greece and after several wars it ended up controlling it. At this point, by the middle of the 2nd century BC, 
the Roman Republic had become the most important power in the Mediterranean and had no rival left. Its armies had been victorious enough for people to forget the unfortunate defeats of early Rome or during the Punic Wars. And Rome was seen as a considerable military power. But what was this war machine actually and how did it work? The Roman army may be one of the longest lasting institutions in the history of the world because if we take into account its continuation with Byzantium it lasted for more than 2000 years but it changed a lot along the centuries. At the beginning, during the Kingdom period and early Republic, it was small and probably based on Etruscan and Greek models. The backbone of the Roman army was infantry and ranks were filled with the lower classes, whereas cavalry, which was comparatively small, was left to the patricians because they had the wealth to afford horses. The role of commander-in-chief was assumed by the king and later by the consuls when the republic was created. In the 5th century, the troops were organized in phalanx, like Greek armies of the time, that is to say, a formation with a line of soldiers armed with spears or pikes. During the Republic, the army was reorganized to create legions. A legion was the equivalent to a division in modern armies. It was an unit of 5,000 to 7,000 men. Legions were divided into smaller units of command. There was the cohort, the tenth of a legion, and then there were groups of a hundred, themselves divided into groups of ten. Most soldiers in the army were citizens. The term legion comes from Latin legio, which means draft or levy. And each man had to provide his equipment. But then with the expansion to all of Italy and the creation of overseas provinces, the army of the Republic grew dramatically in size. The permanent army reached 150,000 men in the 3rd and 2nd centuries. At times of war, this number could be tripled by drafting citizens. Along Roman history, the military became more and more professional and relied less and less on drafting. The equipment was standardized and discipline was extremely strict. This was a huge difference between the Roman army and most of its opponents, like Celtic people, Germanic, North African or Middle Eastern tribes. Very often, Roman armies relied on strict formations that allowed maneuvers on the battlefield, whereas their enemies had a more chaotic and disorganized way of fighting. And the Romans applied their engineering capabilities and technologic edge to their weaponry especially uh, siege weapons. They did not invent these uh, siege weapons. They had been in use for centuries by other nations, but they had engineers accompanying the legions and they could quickly build ballists, scorpions or siege towers. Roman armies could also move very quickly thanks to the network of roads by the end of the empire, there were 50,000 miles of main roads that 
connected all the provinces with uh, the heart of the empire in Italy. After the Punic Wars, the Roman Republic acquired allies around the Mediterranean. Generally, an alliance with Rome was the first step towards absorption into the empire later. So, Roman armies fought often alongside non-Roman troops that remained separated from them in the battlefield. Structurally, Roman armies had relatively few cavalry and bowmen, and the Allies provided this type of troops. The non-citizens fighting alongside the legions were called auxilia, auxiliaries, in the late Republic and Empire period. So with the passing of centuries, this Roman army became increasingly professional. Men signed for a very long service time, 16 to 25 years, depending on the period. After a few campaigns, and with a very strict training, Roman legionaries were by far the most efficient troops in the Mediterranean world. And after the wars against Carthage, the Roman army started to acquire a reputation of invincibility. Even though it is not completely deserved, there were still defeats from time to time. But Rome had such a capacity to replace its armies and such a size that no neighbor could lastingly win against it. Despite the expansion of Rome, I told you earlier that the political system of the Republic could be uh, unstable, with a Senate that represented the views and interests of the elite, the patricians, whereas the plebs had to fight for representation and to be taken into account. But the plebs was able to get concessions. Their people's assembly, their tribunes, had to be respected. They also got rights. For example, patricians and plebeians could not get married in the early republic, and this interdiction was abolished. They also obtained that the laws be put in writing, and this is another remarkable characteristic of ancient Rome, the systematic codification of laws and the attribution of a legal status to every single individual. It depends on where you live, but if it is in Europe or America, in a country of civil or common law, Roman laws are the basic framework of uh, the legal system. This is why there are so many Latin terms in legal terminology. Of course, there were considerable changes since then, reflecting the state of society and the state of right. So what was society like in ancient Rome? It changed over time too. At the center of social organization was the family. And it was not just a biological reality or a tradition. A family was a legal construction. At its head was a master, a pater familias. He was the master of his wife, his children, and even at the beginning of the Republic, the master of the wives of his sons, their children, and, of course, the slaves attached to the family. Because slavery was part of the social order, and when slaves were freed, they remained legally inferior because they were not born free. Their children would be freeborn. Slavery was everywhere, in wealthy homes and in the countryside. Slaves were mostly prisoners of war. 
and their descendants, but many of them ended up being freed by their masters or they had the right to save money and buy their freedom. From a legal standpoint, slaves were considered movable property, almost like a piece of furniture because there were a few limitations, mutilations or acts of cruelty or murder were forbidden by the law, but obviously between the state of right and practice there can be a gap, and in fact life as a slave could be anything from a daily nightmare to almost a decent life when slaves had more generous masters. Apart from the limitation, inequality in status was part of the law. Women were minors and members of the family, the gents, had very little rights. The pater familias was like an absolute king at the head of the family and could punish or make decisions to his discretion. During the Republic, all citizens were allowed to vote to elect the consuls, patricians and plebeians alike. The status of citizens excluded women, children and obviously slaves, and these basic rules remained in effect for centuries. But over time, the law and social views evolved towards a bit more emancipation of family members. The size of the family unit decreased as uh, the sons could form their own family when they got married. So the pater familias no longer ruled over his daughters-in-law and their children. And women were progressively given a little more leeway, but not much. The Roman society was extremely patriarchal. Obviously, these are just general traits and families could be very different. And social class was also a factor. A wealthy woman may have had more actual freedom than a poor man, even a poor citizen. Everyday life in a Roman city revolved a lot around the Forum, which cumulated an economic, social and religious dimension. It was a business district first, where people went to shop and trade, to borrow money, to participate in gatherings like ceremonies or festivities and eventually listen to uh, orators who express their opinions. The forum was also the place where the public opinion was shaped. Going to the forum was a normal daily activity for a Roman citizen, not only in Rome, in all Roman cities. And so was going to a public bath at least once daily. There were separate baths for men and women. Another type of occasion to socialize was through entertainment. Rome, and lesser cities too, built huge infrastructures for this. Entertainment was generally free of cost for the visitors, and sometimes food and beverage were offered to uh, the participants. You may have heard the phrase panem et circenses, meaning bread and games, the formula to keep the populace quiet and uh, avoid revolts. Games and entertainment took particularly epic proportions in the city of Rome. There was the Circus Maximus for chariot racing, and of course the Colosseum, where shows were organized. There were gladiator fights, combat between men, 
or fights between men and wild animals. Over time, these shows became increasingly spectacular and entire battles could be recreated. To us, these uh, shows look at the same time fascinating and also a bit monstrous. Thousands of people gathered to see people getting killed in front of them. It is incredibly cruel and vicious to us. It also reflects what life was like in the antiquity, despite all the refinement in Roman culture. Life was harsh and always very uncertain. Medicine was not very different from magic. It wasn't able to do much in many cases. So the presence or the risk of death was a part of everyday life. And human life had relatively little value. There was no such thing as human rights, of course and it would have sounded uh, completely absurd to a Roman citizen as a concept. In a society with strict separation between social classes, clothing was also very differentiated. Common people generally wore dark tunics made of coarse materials. Patricians, on the opposite, wore linen or white wool tunics and the same distinction existed between the dresses worn by women. Men also wore togas that reflected their age and function. And what did they eat? It depended on the regions, of course, but a typical diet in the city of Rome was made of bread, salad, cheese and fruits, with uh, meat occasionally. In the early Republic, families ate around the table together, but with more wealth and refinement in wealthier circles, a special room with couches for eating, called a triclinium, appeared. During festivities, people would gather in a triclinium, and uh, meals could last for hours, served by slaves to uh, the participants. Wine was a very common beverage for all social classes, starting from the 3rd century BC. You could think that this kind of indulgence and refinement was a sign of uh, looser and looser discipline, but not really. Even though there were excesses happening, losing control was regarded as a serious flaw, and so was alcoholism, for example. Most of the time, wine was served diluted with water, and drinking undiluted wine was seen as a sign of alcoholism and condemned harshly. In political life, the accusation of alcoholism or softness was a frequent against opponents. Another major part of social life was religion. We generally don't represent ourselves, the Romans, as very religious, like, say, the Egyptians, because there are other traits to their civilization, and there was close to no religious fanatism or fundamentalism in ancient Rome. Actually, the Romans never tried to force their gods on anyone. They would just build temples that coexisted with local deities. The idea that proselytism was necessary was alien to them. They just did not see the point. So in this sense, they were tolerant when it comes to religion. But this tolerance had limitations because uh, the frontier between religion and social order, or between church and state, was completely blurred. 
participating in religious ceremonies and showing respect to gods and traditions was a way of socializing and showing your belonging to the world of Rome. I'll tell you later about the emergence of Christianism in the Roman Empire and the persecution of early Christians. They were not persecuted on religious grounds, precisely. The single god that the Christians believed in could have perfectly coexisted with traditional Roman beliefs. The problem was that the Christian faith rejected all other gods as fake idols that uh, should have no place. And uh, Christianism was also critical of many Roman traditions. So when it started to spread, this new religion was perceived as a revolutionary threat directed at the very basis of Roman society. The Christians were asking for the elimination of all other deities and refused to participate in the ceremonies and festivities that regularly reaffirmed the foundations of Roman society. There had been nothing of the sort before Christianism, and this is why for a very long time, until the Christians finally won the fight and obtained the conversion of emperors to the new faith, Christians were seen as an aggressive, fanatical cult that had to be eliminated to preserve social order. But as I said, socializing and being a citizen meant participating in ceremonies, making presents to the gods, and showing signs of respect to Roman traditions. Most public events had a religious dimension. For example, there was the Roman Triumph. It was a parade organized to celebrate the victories of a general. At its core, the triumph was a religious procession. The general displayed his uh, piety and his willingness to serve the public good by dedicating a portion of his spoils to the gods, especially to Jupiter, who represented authority and just rule. Apart from public displays of religiosity, religion was also a daily, private matter. In every home, there was a little shrine where people could pray and make libations to their house gods and their ancestors. But returning to political life under the Republic, a period of political instability started after the Third Punic War, around 130 BC. During the wars against Carthage, the Senate and the Consuls had gained more power in Rome at the expense of the plebs and its people's assembly. And this led to a reaction against the balance of power that now looked too tilted against the people. In 133 BC, a man called Tiberius Gracchus was elected tribune of the plebs and uh, tried to reform agrarian law to favor small peasants, which uh, infuriates large landowners and the Senate too. But his law was adopted by the People's Assembly. So several senators organized his assassination to get rid of him. But ten years later, his brother, Caius Gracchus, was elected tribune of the plebs and kept pushing in the same direction. And even further, he proposed a law that would make it compulsory for the state to provide a cheap wheat to all poor citizens in Rome. This was unacceptable for the Senate, which gave all powers to the consul 
to crush Gracchus' supporters. Troops were brought to the entrance of Rome and forced the separation of Caius Gracchus' followers. Calm came back in the following years, but this episode with the Gracchus brothers was extremely dangerous and damaging to the Republic because violence and assassination had become ways of governing which they weren't before. This weakened the Republic and can be seen as the beginning of a process that will ultimately destroy it from the inside. A few years later, things didn't improve. A general called Marius rose with the support of the plebs. He was sent to pacify Numidia in North Africa and he returned covered in glory. He was elected consul six times in a row and gained more military glory against the Germans in the south of Gaul at the end of the second century BC. He was so popular that the People's Party hoped to uh, uh, use uh, benefit from his prestige to seize power in Rome and uh, marginalize the Senate. Finally, Marius did not dare to do this, but the Republic passed close to a dictatorship by the People's Assembly. And uh, temporary dictatorship happened a few years later with uh, a civil war in Italy with another general, Silla. Silla was uh, another strong man covered in military glory. As he was campaigning in Greece, the plebs seized power in Rome and started to tyrannize aristocrats. Silla returned to Italy and fought armies sent by the People's Assembly. He finally won and took Rome back from the hands of the People's Assembly, becoming a dictator. And he used his power to re-establish balance with the Senate. Silla is remembered as the model of a dictator because after he had used his extraordinary and supposedly temporary powers to restore the Republic, instead of staying, he abdicated and ended his life as a simple citizen. Despite this restoration and the ongoing expansion abroad, the Republic remained unstable and faced with multiple threats in the first century BC. The Senate and the People's Party were still fighting, and at some point the provinces of Spain revolted, pirate activity increased and uh, began to threaten supply lines to Rome. And on top of this, a major slave revolt happened in Italy around the famous slave and gladiator Spartacus. Spartacus' revolt was repressed violently. It is not the only slave, slave revolt that happened, but it is certainly the largest and the most famous one. Faced with all these uh, simultaneous threats, the Senate gave an army to another providential man, Pompey. Pompey was very efficient in solving problems for the Senate. He crushed the People's Party, then he pacified Spain, and he finished to destroy Spartacus' army. When he returned to Rome, he was seen as a savior but he had his own autonomy and was not just a creature of the Senate. He used his uh, powers and influence to uh, re-establish the rights of the tribunes of the plebs, which made him uh, even more popular. And he gained even more popularity by uh, 
supervising the elimination of the pirates' threat and uh, winning more battles in the eastern regions of the Roman territory in uh, Anatolia, Syria and Palestine. In his absence, because he stayed in the Levant for five years, two men rose in Rome. Crassus, a very wealthy politician who became head of the People's Party, and behind Crassus, Julius Caesar. When Pompey returned to Rome, he was covered in more military glory and authority than ever, and uh, given how weak the institutions of the Republic had become, the senators worried about what he could do with his influence. Faced with hostility from the Senate, Pompey allied with Crassus and Caesar to seize power between them. In 60 BC, they formed the so-called Triumvirate. They were granted full powers for five years, with each of them given provinces to oversee. At this point, the Republic, as a regime, had never been weaker, because it could not escape a circle of internal fights between factions and strong men controlling power. But at the same time, Rome, as a state, had never been stronger. The legions had successfully pacified revolted provinces. Italy was under good control after the crushing of Spartacus, and a new phase of accelerated expansion was about to begin. But the days of the Republic were surely numbered, and uh, neither Caesar nor Crassus or Pompey seemed inclined to share power forever. And on this little cliffhanger, we are going to conclude the story for tonight. The rest of it, including the most glorious pages of Roman history, will be in the second part, coming out next week. So stay tuned for this. Thank you very much for your attention, if you have reached this point, and I'll speak to you soon for the rest of the story. Au revoir.